Our text for today is found in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 to 13, and that is found in uh, 1,877, page 1,877 in the Pew Bible. Again, that is Revelation 3, verses 7 to 13. And if you find that in your Bible, and when you find that in your Bible, please uh, stand up and we'll read this. Again, this is Revelation 3, chapter 3, verses 7 to 13, and page 1877 in the Pew Bible. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say, Oh boy. They are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you, because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let us pray. Father God, as John comes to expound your word, Father, I pray just as the word says that he who has an ear, let him hear. Father, that eyes would be open, Lord, that those here who may not know you, Father, their hearts would be pricked and that you would draw them to yourself. Father, I pray uh, that you would give John strength and uh, that as he expounds the word, that um, it would be clear and we would hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I hope you'll keep your Bible open to that passage and kind of follow along as we, as we consider this uh, passage from the book of Revelation. We are kind of nearing the end of our journey through the seven churches of Revelation. We're at church number six. We have one more to go before we have finished our journey through those seven churches. And uh, I'm hoping that the, the exposition of God's word will encourage us and challenge us as his children. If I were to say the, the, the word, uh, the big apple, you'd know exactly what I'm talking about. New York City is the big apple. And if I asked you if you knew what the Windy City was, most of you would know I'm talking about Chicago. A mile High City is Denver. And the City of Angels is Los Angeles. Cities often have other names that either describe something from their history or some characteristic of them. Well, today the church we're going to talk about is the Church of Philadelphia. Now, before America was founded, that name might have been unfamiliar to many people, but since we have a city named Philadelphia here in the U.S., that's a common name, and we know what that means. It means the city of brotherly love. That's what Philadelphia means. And it was named Philadelphia way back when it was nearly when it was founded in 189 B.C., and there was a Pergamum, a king of Pergamum, his name was King Eumenes. 
He's the one that named the city Philadelphia. And he named it in honor of the love he had for his younger brother, whose name was Attalus. The king of Pergamum, King Eumenes, went to war. And during the war, he was considered lost and killed. And the people of, per of the city that uh, existed then made his younger brother, Attalus, king in his place. But a significant amount of time later, King Eumenes returned with some of his troops. He indeed had survived, but his brother had been king for quite a while. But when his older brother returned, rather than continue to hold on to that crown, that kingship, Attalus stepped aside and returned the kingship to his older brother and honored his older brother. Several years later, there were some military leaders that wanted to overthrow King Eumenes and have a coup and make Attalus the king. But in that situation, he refused. He would not join with the rebellion against his brother. And in honor of that love that he had for his older brother, King Eumenes named one of the most prominent cities in Pergamum, Philadelphia, after his younger brother, Attalus, because of his faithful, love and loyalty to him. We're going to see today a church that was faithful in their love and loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ during some turbulent times. Near the city of Philadelphia, which is in modern Turkey, there are some volcanic cliffs because this whole region is characterized by earthquakes and free, frequent seismic disturbances similar to the earthquake we had this week in New York. I don't know if you felt it, we didn't, but uh, a number of people did. And in, 70 AD, in 17 AD, the, the city was nearly destroyed and suffered a great deal from a major earthquake. And because there were such frequent turbulence and seismic disturbances, the people in the city of Philadelphia would often panic and run out of the city lest the buildings fall upon them. And the city was often so unstable that rather than returning and coming to live within the city walls, they began to build villages around the city. And so many of the citizens lived outside the city because there was so much turbulence and uncertainty. Well, we're gonna see in this church of Philadelphia some believers who were living in very turbulent times and rather than give in to the fear and panic around them, they remained loyal to their king and faithful, just as Attalus had remained loyal to his brother, King Eumenes. We've already read the passage, so we're not going to read it again, but let's start by looking at verse 7. And I, this message is entitled, Philadelphia, Faithful in Turbulent Times. If you remember the previous messages, there are usually five sections to Jesus' letter, and he always begins with his credentials. He speaks to them on the basis of something from his character. And we see the same thing this morning in verse 7, where it says, And to the church of the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. And we've already seen in our previous discussions that Jesus applies to himself these names that belong in the Old Testament, the Jews only associated with God the Father. And he calls himself holy and true. And just a couple chapters later, that phrase holy and true is used of God in Revelation 6.10. It says this, and they cried with a loud voice. These are the martyrs under the altar in the book of Revelation. They cried out with a loud voice, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. The holiness and truthfulness of Jesus is attested in the New Testament. Angels proclaimed his holiness when Gabriel came to Mary. She said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. 
Luke 135. Not only did angels proclaim the holiness of Jesus, it was acknowledged even by the demons. And in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus goes into the synagogue, there's a man with an unclean demon, and he cries out to Jesus and says in a loud voice, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus, speaking of himself as the way, the truth, and the life, affirms these characteristics of himself. He is making a claim to deity that he is the Son of God. And this was to draw a stark contrast between the other major character we've seen active in these letters, and that is Satan. We've seen already a group of Jews called the synagogue of Satan. We've seen one of the cities referred to as the throne of Satan. And so we know that the enemy of God has been active in in and around these churches. And here he's drawing, the Lord Jesus is drawing a stark contrast between himself and Satan, the God of this world. His followers we've seen have wickedness in their lives and teach deceitful heresies. The Nicolaitans for one and Jezebel, the false prophetess for another who served the ends of Satan. Here in the city of Philadelphia, there was a very powerful synagogue of Jewish people, and they were actively persecuting the Christians. They were telling them, your Messiah Jesus is no Messiah. You are not following the truth. And so they would often excommunicate the Christian Jews and kick them out of the synagogue. And Jesus calls them the synagogue of Satan. And he says, they lie in verse nine. And they were, even though they were denying that Jesus was the true Messiah, here the Lord Jesus is denying that they are actually true Jews. They may have been ethnic Jews, they may have been circumcised, but as Paul reminds us in Romans nine, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. And a little in Romans chapter two, he addresses this issue again in Romans 2.28. Paul says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So here, Christ is coming to this church, this beleaguered church in Philadelphia, and he's comforting them and encouraging them and reminding them that he is the true Messiah. No matter what these powerful forces in the city are saying about him and condemning Jesus and calling him a deceiver and a liar, here the Son of God is reminding those who trust in him that he is their Messiah and they are in fact the true people of God no matter what the powerful cultural leaders have to say. Jesus is Lord and King and Messiah. The other thing he says is in Verse 7, he refers to this phrase, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. And he's actually quoting from Isaiah chapter 22, back in the days of King Hezekiah. The second in command in Israel was called the chief steward or the chief administrator. And next to the king, he controlled all the access to the throne room and all the access to the wealth and power of the kingdom. He was like the prime minister. And in the days of Hezekiah, the name of that person was Shebna, but Shebna was a wicked man. And Shebna was using his position for his own authority and power. As a matter of fact, he, was, he thought himself so important that he built his own tomb in Jerusalem among the tombs of the kings. That's how highly he thought of himself. But in judgment, God spoke through Isaiah the prophet to Shebna. And this is what he said in Isaiah chapter 22, verses 20 through 23. Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, 
the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder, so he shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. I will fasten him as a peg or a pillar in a secure place, and he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. So God was going to take that authority that Shebna possessed and gave it to another more worthy. And that person in Hezekiah's time was Eliakim. But if you remember what Isaiah had said earlier in Isaiah chapter 9, this is also looking forward to the ultimate one who would come to be the chief administrator of the kingdom of God. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. In his position, first I want to read a comment from a commentator, and then I'll read the Isaiah chapter. This is what the commentator says about Eliakim, who replaced Shebna. In his position as chief administrator, second in command, Eliakim served as the ultimate gatekeeper granting or denying access to the house of David at his discretion. He could open the door and no one could shut it. Having the door open meant access to the king's presence and thus to the God-given authority and blessings of the royal line, as well as to all the resources of treasury and storehouse. But if the steward shut the door, he blocked all of that access and no one could overrule his decision a very important and powerful position in Israel. And here it reminds us of what Isaiah said about the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what he said in verse Isaiah 20, the key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. Isaiah writes, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So the Jews in Philadelphia who had persecuted the Christians, excommunicated them from the synagogue and proclaimed that they no longer had access to God's kingdom as God's people because they were following this Jesus. Even though they thought they were slamming the door to the kingdom of God in the face of those believers, Jesus is saying they have no authority to do that. I am the one who opens the door and no one shuts. I am the one who shuts the door and no one opens it. So he's reminding these persecuted Christians that he is the chief administrator and he alone has the authority to grant them access to God's kingdom, access to the throne room, access to the very presence of God. So those are Christ's credentials as he comes and speaks to his beleaguered people. The second thing we see is Christ's commendation. We notice he always gave his credentials in the previous letters and then he would commend them. And he always started his commendation with the same phrase, I know your works. And he does the same thing here. But there's a little difference in this letter because he's going to mention their uh, three characteristics for which he commends them, but he's also going to ins- intersperse with those his own commitment and response to their faithfulness. So first we're just going to look at his commendation, and then we'll take a look at what Jesus said about their strengths. So if you look at verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. And those are the three qualities of these believers that Jesus commends. You have a little strength, you have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. 
What does that mean? Well, let's look at that first one. You have a little strength. This was a small, struggling church. We can identify with them. A small, struggling church in an increasingly hostile culture in which their beliefs were being attacked. And Christ doesn't condemn them for having a little power. He doesn't condemn them for being weak. He, he recognizes that their spiritual strength only comes from one source, and that's from God. Even though they may have very little political clout, they may have very little social influence from a human perspective, Jesus says you have a little power, and that power is from the right source. It reminded me of what Isaiah said in Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 31, about the true source of spiritual power. Isaiah writes, have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, never faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the young people shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. These believers were trusting in the Lord. They were waiting upon him. They were not relying upon human means of power and influence. Is there a lesson there for our little church? Is there a lesson for the church in America? Do we look to God for the strength to fulfill his purpose for us? Or do we use the means of men to try and gain power and strength? Is it all about numbers and money? Is it all about using corporate business practices and marketing techniques? Is it all about having celebrity pastors, entertainment, glitzy programs and musicals and political and social influence? Is that what the church needs in order to exert influence on our culture? Do we need man's wisdom and man's riches and man's might? Listen to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. And so he was commending them and for their looking to him for their strength. The second thing he says, you have kept my word, and in the face of rejection and persecution by the Jewish community and by the Roman government leaders, and even when their sister churches in, in Asia and other cities had compromised their faith and fallen into false teaching and loveless orthodoxy, these believers had kept his word. They remained faithful and obedient to the word of God. That is the fundamental foundation of true discipleship, diligent and disciplined obedience to the word of God. Jesus had a lot to say about that. I'm going to just give you three brief references from the Gospel of John in terms of the importance of the word of God in the lives of his people that he expects us to keep. In John 8, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In John 14, 21, Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And finally, in John 15, 7 and 8, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, 
so you will be my disciples. Discipleship, the root word is discipline. And we must be disciplined studiers and believers and obeyers of the word of God if we want to receive the commendation of our Lord Jesus. Coming to church once a week is good, but it's not enough. Putting a few bucks in the offering plate is good, but it's not enough. Reading your Bible is good, but that in itself is not enough. Saying grace before a meal is good, but it's not enough. You don't have to really believe in Jesus to do any of those things. Those are all outward actions of religious people. They don't necessarily translate to your heart attitude of love and obedience for God. Those aren't bad things. Those are all things we should do. But if that's the sum total of our faith, we are lacking an understanding of what Jesus meant when he called us to be his disciples. If you remember the lesson Jesus gave about the house built on the sand versus the house that built on the rock, you know the only difference was? To both of them he said, therefore whoever hears these saying of mine, he said that in both cases, they heard what Jesus said, but the difference is the one who built his house upon the rock, Jesus said, whoever hears these saying of mine and does them. To those whose house were built on the sand, Jesus said, whoever hears these saying of mine and does not do them. It's what we do as believers that demonstrate the genuineness of our faith in Christ. Salvation is a gift, but discipleship requires the hearing and obeying of the word of God. You can be a Christian for five, 10, 25, 50 years and still be a spiritual baby, still only be able to handle milk. Christ wants us to grow up. He wants us to become disciples. These believers in Philadelphia, they were disciples, disciplined learners. And the third thing he says, you have not denied my name. In the midst of that hostile culture, the Philadelphian Christians had been under pressure to deny their loyalty and allegiance to Christ in order to be accepted and fit in. Many nominal Christians had done so when it became unpopular and costly to identify as a follower of Jesus. But this small group of faithful believers had refused to renounce their faith and deny their Lord. Jesus had a lot to say about loyalty. And in his earthly ministry, he said some very challenging words that you don't often hear in the church today among evangelicals. Listen to what he said in Matthew 10. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. What's your loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel? These believers in Philadelphia were loyal even in the midst of persecution and suffering. The question we have to ask ourselves is, when push comes to shove in our Christian, between our Christian faith and what we believe the Bible says versus what the culture around us believes and demands that we believe and celebrate, whether it's people in your family, whether it's your coworkers, maybe it's your circle of friends, people in your community, will you remain true to him and his kingdom? even if it costs you relationships,
promotions, social invitations, even if it brings outright persecution. These Philadelphia Christians set an example for us. They remain loyal to their Lord Jesus. They put him above all else. May we do the same. Next, in the other letters we've seen, Christ would usually bring a complaint. He would say, but I have this against you. And then he would list the weaknesses of the church that was he wanted to point out to them. But here in this church, there is no complaint. Instead, there are the commitments that Christ makes to them because they are faithful. And these are the things that he said in verses 7 through 9. Um, actually 7 through 10 about his response to their faithfulness. The first thing he says about them is, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it for you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. The first commitment Christ makes to them is what I call kingdom access. Kingdom access. He says there's an open door. Now there's two ways you can interpret that. In Paul's letters, when he talks about an open door, he's usually talking about a gospel opportunity, an opportunity for him to share the gospel. For example, 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul says, for a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries. And in Colossians 4, 3, he similarly says, meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ. And if that's what Christ means by the open door, he's reminding us that even in the most hostile and unfavorable circumstances, he can provide an opportunity for us to bear witness to Christ. We are not to be silent, even in hostile circumstances, but we are to be prepared to share our faith in Christ. But in order to do that, we need to be prepared and Peter reminds us how to do that in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify Christ in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Are you prepared to give a witness when the Lord opens the door? Do you think about it? before you start your day? Have you thought about what you might say to someone? Dwight L. Moody said, if I spend more than, if, I'm, if the Lord puts me with another person for more, 15 minutes or more, I automatically assume it's because he wants me to share the gospel with them and he would share the gospel with them. And he was often criticized. One woman came up to him and said, I really don't agree with your evangelistic methods. And he said, yes, I agree. They're certainly not what they should be. What method do you use? And she said, well, I actually don't have a method. He goes, well, I like my method better. <laughs> no matter if you're weak in witnessing, ask God to give you that opportunity and you will grow in your wisdom and strength as you do it. If you never do it, you'll always feel insecure. Sometimes we have to step out by faith and say, here I go, Lord, guide me. Help me to say what needs to be said. So it could be a gospel opportunity, but more Bible teachers believe that he's talking about not a gospel opportunity, but a door is a means of access. That he's talking about access to God's presence and the heavenly kingdom. One of the reasons they feel that way is the very next chapter begins with these words. After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And there it's a reference to an entrance into heaven. And this brings us again back to Isaiah 22, that passage where Jesus compares himself to the chief administrator who controls access to the throne of God. And so Christ may be committing to them, reminding them that he owns, he is the possessor of the key of David and access into the kingdom of God is only and always through him. That no matter what others do, no one can shut them out of his kingdom. And they may have been hurting and sad and discouraged because of their excommunication, but here he wants to comfort them. The second thing Christ commits to is vindication. He says this in verse nine, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. 
The translated word there, worship, is not the best interpretation. It really is just the word to bow down. I will make them come and bow down before you and acknowledge that I have loved you. And this is reminiscent of many Old Testament scriptures that taught that the Gentiles who were persecuting the Jews in the Old Testament ultimately would come and bow down before them when they recognized that they were God's people and that they had been truthful to the true God. And here Christ is flipping that illustration around that instead of the Gentiles coming to bow down before the Jews and recognize that they are God's people, here Christ is saying, those Jewish persecutors are gonna come before you and bow down and acknowledge that you are my people and that I love you. So it's a vindication of their faith and love in Christ. And the third thing he says is, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. That's in verse 10. <clears throat> now, we've already talked in Sunday school about some people, uh, some dispensationalist believers think that Jesus is talking about the rapture, that in the last day before the great tribulation, Jesus is going to come and catch away the believers, and they will not go through the great tribulation. That's one interpretation. And uh, there are those that hold that interpretation. But another possible interpretation is what some uh, other Bible teachers believe. And they think that Jesus is not talking about something that's about to happen 2,000 years in the future. What would that mean to these Philadelphia Christians? It wouldn't, that wouldn't be something they even thought about. But rather, he's talking about something that's coming much closer during their lifetime. And so there are those that think that he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Romans and the turbulence in the Roman Empire that came around the same time. The word the whole world is used sometimes as a description of the Roman Empire in the Bible. To them, that was the whole world. And the uh, phrase, those who dwell on the earth, the earth was a euphemism for Israel. So he's talking about the Israelites. So what Jesus could be saying is that there is a coming time of turbulence and political unrest. And during that time, just as I have kept you through these trials you have experienced in Philadelphia, I will keep you during that time. I will preserve you. I will hold you fast you will persevere to the end and I will bring you to glory in myself. And so that was a promise that just as they were faithful to him, he would be faithful to them and keep them in every trial. Next usually would come a correction where Christ would in the other letters tell them what they needed to do to address the complaints that he had about them, but there's no correction in this letter Instead, there's one command, and that command is in verse 11. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He gives them a positive reason for holding fast. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly. I will be with you. Whether that means in a special, special spiritual presence, in uh, strengthening them. In all the other letters that we've seen, when Jesus said, I will come to you quickly, it was usually in judgment. I will remove your lampstand. You know, I will fight against them with the word of my mouth. But here, instead of it being a threat, it's actually a comforting promise of his presence and ultimate deliverance. And then he gives them a negative reason. He says, so that no one may take your crown. We can never rest on our laurels. It's an interesting phrase, laurel. It's that wreath. And that wreath was what was woven into what was called the Stephanos, or the victor's crown. And that's what he's talking about here. Not the big heavy metal crown of the kings and queens, not the diadem, but the wreath that was placed on the head of the winners of the Olympic Games. And so he's telling them, if we are not moving forward in faith, we will backslide into unbelief and spiritual wicked weakness. If we take our eyes off Christ and put them on our circumstances or our adversaries, we will stumble and fall. We will not finish the race. Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians. 
when he says to his fellow believers, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or disciplined in all things. Now they then do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Paul is encouraging the believers in Corinth, just as Jesus is encouraging the believers in Philadelphia to be disciplined Christians, persevering through the challenges that face them. To finish well and obtain the crown will require perseverance, self-discipline, and dedication. And finally, in verse 12, we see Christ's consequences. Normally, there would be negative consequences if you don't do this and positive consequences if they would do it. Here, there are no negative consequences. It speaks very highly of this church. Jesus thought very highly of this church in Philadelphia. And the positive consequence, he says in verse 12, he who overcomes, that word overcome, as we've seen in the past, is the Greek word from which we get Nike, victor, champion. And he tells them two things, two things they will get as a consequence of their faith. The first is an honored and guaranteed place in his kingdom. He says, I will make him a pillar Sounds pretty boring. Somebody say, I'll make you a pillar. Pillar's just a block of marble. But in the ancient world, the pillars were significant and important parts of their construction of these huge, beautiful buildings. And they were uh, used to uphold and beautify them. They were prominently displayed in very visible location. And often they had inscriptions on them of the names of citizens that they wanted to honor. And so Jesus is saying, I'm going to make you pillars. We actually still use that phrase. Someone, we would say, he's a pillar in his community. He's an upstanding man. Jesus is saying, I'm going to make you that in my kingdom. I'm going to make you a pillar. Now, remember, I talked about Philadelphia. It was an unstable city. The ground often shook. People often would look up and feel the shaking and run because they didn't want to be crushed under the falling debris from the building. Any moment, those buildings might give way. And so they knew what it was like to live in unstable, turbulent conditions, both geologically and culturally. They never knew when the Roman government would turn on them and persecute them and kill them. The Jews were telling the Romans, the Christians are not part of us. They're no longer should be protected by the protection that we as Jews have. And they threw the Christians under the bus and told the Romans that they were insurrectionists and were dangerous people. And so these Christians were used to their social standing changing suddenly. But here Christ promises them the security of a guaranteed place in his kingdom from which they would never have to leave. They, when they were in the kingdom, you never had to be afraid that all of a sudden you're going to have to run out and get out of there. You are in a place that is safe and secure, like a pillar in the temple. And that's what one of the promises he made to them, an honored and guaranteed place. And finally, a privileged identity. One of the, I like books. And what's the first thing I do when I get a book? If I intend to keep it, I write my name on it. If you have something important to you that you don't want to lose, especially like kids going to school, your name's on your backpack or in your jacket, identification, this is mine, it belongs to me. And here Jesus is saying that they are such a precious purchased possession of his that he is writing his name on them. Not only his name, but the name of his father, the high king of heaven, and also the name of the city of the great king, the new Jerusalem, the city where God dwells, which one day will descend from heaven to earth when Christ's kingdom comes and heaven comes to earth, but which exists right now in the church of Christ. We are citizens of the new Jerusalem already. 
Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. And so someday we will see the reality of that. But now on earth, we are already beginning to experience the wonder of being citizens of God's kingdom. And we have his name and we will have the name of the Father, the name of the new Jerusalem, and the name of Christ written on us as his possession. I think we'll all wear sweatshirts that say New Jerusalem. That'll be, that'll be what we'll be wearing. And just so you see this in the rest of the book of Revelation, in Revelation 41, then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. And in Revelation 22, 3 and 5, and there shall be, this is the end, listen, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. They shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That's our future. That's Christ's commitment to us. The consequences of our faithful faith, obedience, and loyalty to him. So in closing, the Philadelphia Christians face turbulent, uncertain times, just as we do today. They did not know what the days ahead held for them, and neither do we. But their Lord wanted to comfort and encourage them to continue on, to keep on doing those things for which he rewarded them, to draw spiritual strength and power from their faith in him, not trusting in themselves, but trusting in Christ, to obediently keep his word and to remain loyal to him no matter what the cost. Will you do those things? in the culture in which you're living? If you will, the commitment that he made to them is the commitment he will make to you. You will be granted eternal access to the kingdom of God. One day you will be vindicated for the faith that you've held before all the enemies who have ridiculed you and rejected you and dismissed you and marginalized you someday. In that great day, your faith in Christ will be vindicated. The Bible says no one who trusts in the Lord will ever be ashamed. We do not have to be ashamed of our faith in Christ. And finally, no matter what trials come, he promises to preserve us through them and he will hold us fast. <clears throat> and then the ultimate promises he makes, those two great promises, that both for now and for eternity, that we are having honored and guaranteed place in his kingdom as pillars in the temple of the new Jerusalem. And we will have that privileged identity. He's gonna write his name all over us. That's mine, that one's mine. I want everybody in the universe to know this one belongs to me. We can learn much about how we as Christians facing an increasingly hostile culture should walk as believers from these Christians in Philadelphia. Although times and circumstances may change, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his commitment to his church today is the same as it was in the first century. May God grant us the courage and perseverance that we too, like the Philadelphian believers, may live lives pleasing to him as we remain loyal to our Lord and obedient to his word and glorify his name so that one day we may hear him say to us, as I'm sure he said to those Philadelphian believers on the day they saw him face to face, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of opening your word and the freedom to study it and proclaim it. 
Lord, we thank you for these brothers and sisters from 2,000 years ago that we can still read about their faith and their courage and their perseverance and their loyalty to you. And they faced very difficult times. And Lord, as we look forward and see an uncertain future, we ask that you would grant us the same faith the same strength, the same obedience, the same loyalty that they exhibited, that we might be faithful to our generation as they will faithful to theirs. Bless this church, Lord. Bless every church in America where you are loved and your word is honored, that we might be dis disciplined and obedient disciples to bring the gospel and the opportunities that you provide for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.